Section 15 of Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers. Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 1, by John Calvin. Translated by Henry Beveridge. Chapter 9. All the principles of piety subverted by fanatics, who substitute revelations for scripture. Sections. 1. The temper and error of the libertines, who take to themselves the name of spiritual briefly described. The refutation. 1. The apostles and all true Christians have embraced the written word. This confirmed by a passage in Isaiah. Also by the example and words of Paul. 2. The Spirit of Christ seals the doctrine of the written word on the minds of the godly. 2. Refutation continued. 3. The impositions of Satan cannot be detected without the aid of the written word. First objection, the answer to it. 3. Second objection from the words of Paul as to the letter and spirit. The answer with an explanation of Paul's meaning, how the spirit and the written word are indissolubly connected. 1. Those who, rejecting Scripture, imagine that they have some peculiar way of penetrating to God are to be deemed not so much under the influence of error as madness. For certain giddy men have lately appeared who, while they make a great display of the superiority of the Spirit, reject all reading of the Scriptures themselves and deride the simplicity of those who only delight in what they call the dead and deadly letter. But I wish they would tell me what spirit it is whose inspiration raises them to such a sublime height that they dare despise the doctrine of Scripture as mean and childish. If they answer that it is the Spirit of Christ, their confidence is exceedingly ridiculous, since they will, I presume, admit that the apostles and other believers in the primitive church were not illuminated by any other spirit. None of these thereby learned to despise the Word of God, but every one was imbued with greater reverence for it, as their writings most clearly testify. And indeed, it had been so foretold by the mouth of Isaiah. For when he says, My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. He does not tie down the ancient church to external doctrine, as he were a mere teacher of elements, he rather shows that, under the reign of Christ, the true and full felicity of the new church will consist in their being ruled not less by the word than by the Spirit of God. Hence we infer that these miscreants are guilty of fearful sacrilege in tearing asunder what the prophet joins in indissoluble union. Add to this that Paul, though carried up even to the third heaven, ceased not to profit by the doctrine of the law and the prophets, while, in like manner, he exhorts Timothy, a teacher of singular excellence, to give attention to reading, 1 Timothy 4.13. And the eulogium, which he pronounces on Scripture, well deserves to be remembered, viz., that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. 2 Timothy 3.16 What an infatuation of the devil, therefore, to fancy that Scripture, which conducts the sons of God to the final goal, is of transient and temporary use. Again, I should like those people to tell me whether they have imbibed any other spirit than that which Christ promised to his disciples. Though their madness is extreme, it will scarcely carry them the length of making this their boast. But what kind of spirit did our Savior promise to send? One who should not speak of himself, John 16, 13, but suggest and instill the truths which he himself had delivered through the word. Hence the office of the Spirit promised to us is not to form new and unheard of revelations or to coin a new form of doctrine by which we may be led away from the received doctrine of the gospel, but to seal on our minds the very doctrine which the gospel recommends. 2. Hence, it is easy to understand that we must give diligent heed both to the reading and hearing of Scripture, 
if we would obtain any benefit from the Spirit of God. Just as Peter praises those who attentively study the doctrine of the prophets, 2 Peter 1.19, though it might have been thought to be superseded after the gospel light arose, and, on the contrary, that any spirit which passes by the wisdom of God's word and suggests any other doctrine is deservedly suspected of vanity and falsehood. Since Satan transforms himself into an angel of light, what authority can the spirit have with us if he be not ascertained by an infallible mark? And assuredly, he is pointed out to us by the Lord with sufficient clearness. But these miserable men err as if bent on their own destruction, while they seek the spirit from themselves rather than from him. But they say that it is insulting to subject the spirit, to whom all things are to be subject, to the scripture, as if it were disgraceful to the Holy Spirit to maintain a perfect resemblance throughout and be in all respects without variation consistent with himself. True, if he were subjected to a human, an angelical, or to any foreign standard, it might be thought that he was rendered subordinate, or, if you will, brought into bondage. But so long as he is compared with himself and considered in himself, how can it be said that he is thereby injured? I admit that he is brought to a test, but the very test by which it has pleased him that his majesty should be confirmed. It ought to be enough for us once we hear his voice, but lest Satan should insinuate himself under his name, he wishes us to recognize him by the image which he has stamped on the scriptures. The author of the scriptures cannot vary and change his likeness. Such as he there appeared at first, such he will perpetually remain. There is nothing contumelious to him in this, unless we are to think it would be honorable for him to degenerate and revolt against himself. 3. Their cavil about our cleaving to the dead letters carries with it the punishment which they deserve for despising Scripture. It is clear that Paul is there arguing against false apostles, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who, by recommending the law without Christ, deprive the people of the benefit of the new covenant by which the Lord engages that he will write his law on the hearts of believers and engrave it on their inward parts. The letter, therefore, is dead, and the law of the Lord kills its readers when it is dissevered from the grace of Christ and only sounds in the ear without touching the heart. But if it is effectually impressed on the heart by the Spirit, if it exhibits Christ, it is the word of life converting the soul and making wise the simple. Nay, in the very same passage, the apostle calls his own preaching the ministration of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, eight, intimating that the Holy Spirit so cleaves to his own truth as he has expressed it in Scripture that he then only exerts and puts forth his strength when the word is received with due honor and respect. There is nothing repugnant here to what was lately said, chapter 7, that we have no great certainty of the word itself until it be confirmed by the testimony of the Spirit. For the Lord has so knit together the certainty of his word and his spirit that our minds are duly imbued with reverence for the word when the Spirit shining upon it enables us there to behold the face of God. And, on the other hand, we embrace the Spirit with no danger of delusion when we recognize Him in His image, that is, in His Word. Thus, indeed, it is. God did not produce His Word before men for the sake of sudden display, intending to abolish it the moment the Spirit should arrive, but He employed the same Spirit by whose agency He had administered the Word to complete His work by the efficacious confirmation of the Word. In this way, Christ explained to the two disciples, Luke 24, 27, not that they were to reject the scriptures and trust to their own wisdom, but that they were to understand the scriptures. In like manner, when Paul says to the Thessalonians, quench not the spirit, he does not carry them aloft to empty speculation apart from the word. He immediately adds, despise not prophesying, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 and 20. By this, doubtless, he intimates that the light of the Spirit is quenched the moment prophesying fall into contempt. How is this answered by those swelling enthusiasts in whose idea the only true illumination consists in carelessly laying aside 
and bidding adieu to the word of God, while with no less confidence than folly, they fasten upon any dreaming notion which may have casually sprung up in their minds. Surely a very different sobriety becomes the children of God, as they feel that without the Spirit of God they are utterly devoid of the light of truth. So they are not ignorant that the Word is the instrument by which the illumination of the Spirit is dispensed. They know of no other Spirit than the one who dwelt and spake in the apostles, the Spirit by whose oracles they are daily invited to the hearing of the Word. End of section 15. Recording by Sean F. Sawyers, St. Louis, Missouri.